Wow. We're getting off to a good start this morning, right? Shabbat shalom, everyone. You know, some of us have had a little extra time off, and we've been able to pray a lot more. And I just sense that the Father's doing so many new things this year in us and through us and with us. And I'm excited for what he's doing. I'm excited that we were born for such a time as this. There's so much to learn, so much to learn. I'm going to go ahead and start our Torah portion because I feel like it's, it's, it's an exciting portion for us and uh, because it's applicable right now today. So I kind of subtitled today's uh, Torah portion, How Did the Messiah, You, a Donkey, Adoption, and a Bunch of rabbi, Rabbis, and the End Times Connect? And so, before we're done, I hope you will see the connection, because our Father is on the move, and He is not uh, tarrying. He, in fact, if anything, things are speeding up. And um, I think, you know, personally, I believe this is going to be a very significant year in so many ways, but mostly for the people of God and those who are called according to to his purposes and, and, and what he's doing in them. Veahi actually means he lived, but I want to say he lives <laughs> because everything points to the Messiah, and so it's actually really talking about the Messiah. So not only did he live, he lives today, and so that's important for us to, to get, know, and understand. I also want to lay a foundation here. Now, remember last week in, in the Torah portion, um, it was about Joseph and his brothers recognizing him and he, you know, him being a perfect picture of the Messiah and then realizing, oh my gosh, that's our brother, but he looks like an Egyptian and he walks like an Egyptian. And he talks like an Egyptian. Oh, Don, you want to come up and do that on a live stream? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> he had the walk like an Egyptian Don't go in, for those of you who couldn't see back there. Um, but it's no wonder that our brother Judah doesn't recognize us because we look like a bunch of Egyptians. And we act like a bunch of Egyptians. And so they're looking at us wondering, what in the world are you guys, and why are you studying my Torah? Because you just heard what Lance said, Judah was given the responsibility of keeping the Torah and bringing forth the redemption and the Messiah. When I read this week's Torah portion, I just have to say this, I was so impressed with our father Jacob being such a great prophet. Because in the natural, in the flesh, if he had not have been speaking the word of God, just think about this for a minute, who would have been the one he would have given the responsibility of keeping Torah and having the line of Messiah come through? Joseph, his favored son. His, he would have naturally gravitated there. But instead... He heard the voice of Yah. He surrendered his will to the will of the Father. And that's something we need to do. So much of what we do is done in the flesh. Now, can I get an amen? Or is everybody just going to give me dirty looks? But if we're being honest, if we're being truly honest, so much of what we do is in the realm of the flesh rather than hearing the voice of Yah and following that, even if it doesn't agree with our flesh. See, most of us today, I'm speaking about, I'm not talking about people in this congregation because we're all perfect here, but, you know, some other places, they will agree with something Yahweh says if it agrees with their flesh. Like, I'm going to make you a great prophet. Oh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, yeah, of course, you know, because it agrees with your flesh. But if, if Yahweh says, I want you to clean toilets, 
in in the you know outside the sanctuary for a while. That doesn't agree with your flesh. So the first thing we do is go. Oops, I'm not going to do that. Why would that couldn't be God? Why would He ask me to do something like that, right? And the reason that He asks us to do things that aren't comfortable is for our heart. For us to to know where our heart's at and what's really in us. I have done so many things, and I know all of you have, that have been just so uncomfortable that I didn't want to do. But after I did them, I saw I saw the wisdom of Yahweh in that. And sometimes it's it's not sometimes, most of the time it, it is very humbling. But I want you to remember what the promise is about. And I'm not going to do the Brad Scott thing. It's about a house, a family, and, <laughs> and land, right? Um, so I, I switched it up a little bit. And I said, the promise is about a land, a people, and a blessing. And I believe that's equally as true. It's about the land, a people, and a blessing. That's what the, that's what the gospel is. That's what the good news truly is. Why was it so important for Jacob when he told Joseph, or requested of Joseph, you know, swear to me, he said it twice, you know, that you're going to take my bones back to the land and I'm going to be buried there. Because in Jacob, all 12 sons are together, much like the house of David. It was important for him as the father of our faith to be laid to rest in the land of the promise. You understand that? And that's why he was so obsessed with that, you know, and he wanted to make sure that Joseph understood, and Joseph did it. Jacob represented all 12 tribes of Israel, and returning home to the land of Jacob, or Israel, for a burial was in agreement with the covenant and would signify a time in the future when all 12 would return back to the land. So on this oath, What happened next was Joseph promised to carry his father's body back to the land for burial. His assurance that he would do this actually demonstrated above and beyond anything else that Jacob understood the gospel. He understood their family's destiny. He understood what the future would hold through Yahweh's covenant. And it included a land, a people, and a blessing. Now, oh my gosh, there's those wild and crazy Jewish rabbis. Um, And the reason I put their picture up here, because this is to me, just saying to me, not to everybody, but to me, this was, when I read this, this was one of the biggest miracles that's happened since 1948, I believe, when Israel became a state again, when God gathered his pe- began gathering his people and putting them back in the land. More than 25 prominent rabbis from Israel and abroad recently issued a statement calling for a renewed look at Jesus, at Yeshua. That is a miracle. For 2,000 years, they've said that Yeshua violated the Torah, that he broke the commandments, that he couldn't be, he could not be the Messiah. This just happened. Okay, now listen to this. This is a quote here, or I'm going to get into the quote called for an, a new look at, at Jesus, the Christians, and the New Testament faith. This is so good. Quoting from their own sages, these outstanding, and they're highly respected. These aren't the low rung of the ladder. These are the ones that people respect. Quoting from their own sages, these outstanding Orthodox rabbis are not ashamed to exalt the name of Jesus the name of Yeshua, welcoming the carpenter from Nazareth back into the Jewish fold. (laughs) That is amazing. That's a miracle. 
We're watching miracle after miracle after miracle happen. Even in our day, it's such a blessing. Now, this is a quote. Jesus brought, and this is what they're saying. This is their statement. Jesus brought a double goodness to the world, declare, declare the group of well-known rabbis. Now, this reminded me of Fiddler on the Roof. I don't, on the one hand, <laughs> he strengthened the Torah of Moses majestically, and not one of our sages spoke out more emphatically concerning the immutability of the Torah. And on the other hand, he removed idols from the nations. What? What? Now, we all know the prophecy. We all know that Judah will one day recognize us. And I thought, wow, this is coming the same weeks that the, this is the Torah portions? <sighs> when the brothers recognize, they're looking, wait a minute, he looks like an Egyptian. The, I, I, I hope you understand what a great miracle this is. Nothing like this has happened in over 2,000 years. Kind of a miracle. And it's, it's, to me, it just like, Yahweh, you are so amazing. And your spirit is moving, and it's doing things, and it's changing hearts, and it's preparing the soil, and it's preparing the ground for all of us to dwell in the land to receive the blessing of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as one people, with one Messiah. All of these are, I mean, these are preordained miracles. So I'm going to ask you this. This is just a little question I need to ask. If Yeshua, when he's delivering the blessings... If, if, if Jacob, who was listening to the word of God, who became flesh, Yeshua, Yahweh, you know, um, and he was able to say more, well more than 2,000 years, in probably three, over 3,000 years in the future, who was going to keep the Torah, how they were going to be restored back to the land, all of the promises, and nailed it to the T. When I was studying that this week, I felt like the Father said to me, do you think I can handle your life? I mean, think about that for a minute. You think he doesn't know everything about you? everything that's happened, everything that's going to happen, and he has you in the palm of his hands, and he knows you may be messing up big time this week, but by three Tuesdays from now, you're going to get a revelation, and it's, it's going to pop in your head, and you're going to change that, that horrible habit you have, that bad way of looking at things, because he knows who he's called, and he's called you by name. <sighs> It is so powerful. It is so powerful. We can lay hold of it. Our problem is, is we're such numbskulls. I just repented to, to the Father yesterday. I, I asked him, I, I just, I said, Lord, I am sorry. I obviously have been such a knucklehead that you had to do everything that's happened in my life, and I've had a whole lot of negative things happen just to get my attention so what's that say about me? You know, instead of saying, oh, poor me. All these bad things have come upon me. Well, if bad things are coming upon us, just like they came upon Joseph, because he was kind of a little knucklehead. He was rubbing it in his, you know, brother's face, you know, about these dreams and everything. Yahweh had to change him. Yahweh has to change us. He knows what he's doing. So if you have bad things happening, instead of blaming 
Yahweh, we should be praising him that he loves us enough to allow us to go through what we need to go through to get where he wants to bring us. <sighs> he is an awesome God, an awesome God. Now, laying that foundation, let's go. Uh, Genesis 48, 1 through 4. Now it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father is sick. And he took him with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And J Jacob was told, look, your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself and sat up on the bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty, El Shaddai, appeared to me at Lutz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. See, I, I've heard it argued before, and this is why you need to let the Bible interpret itself. You know, who was, who was Jacob wrestling with? You know, this angel. Who was it? Well, it tells you right here. Jacob had no doubt who it was. It was God Almighty. That's who he was wrestling with. Same one we wrestle with, if we'll be honest in it and, and admit it. And notice what he says. And he said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make of you a multitude of people and give this land. Whew, that's our land. Give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. And now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine as Reuben and Simeon. They shall be mine. Now, those are pre that's pretty strong words. You know, I thought about that, and I thought if I had two sons... And my dad said to me, these are my sons. I would probably be tugging back and go, no, those are my sons. You know, were you getting senile or something? No, these are my sons. No, they're my sons. And you, I'd be, you know, there'd be a tug of war going on, wouldn't there? It's interesting. This is worded this way for a reason. We're going to get into that. Who were born to you in the land of Egypt. They weren't even Hebrews. They were half Egyptians. Their mom was Egyptian. Just like us. Our father's Hebrew, but our mother is the nations that we were dispersed into. Your offspring, whom you beget after them, shall be yours. So he's saying, these guys are mine. You can go procreate with your honey all you want, and you can have other offspring, but I'm taking these two guys. Wow. That's pretty powerful when you think about it. You know, most of the time we skim over stuff like that, and it's just like, oh, yeah, Bible talk, Bible talk, Bible talk. But there's a purpose for everything that's written, and it's, it's for our good and our benefit. They will be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. From this time forward, Jacob was announcing that Ephraim and Manasseh were to be his full blood sons. I want us to get this concept because this is imperative for us to know who we are in, in God. They were not to be referred, referred to as his half-Hebrew, half-Egyptian grandsons, even though their mother... Asenath was an Egyptian, they were to be considered his full Hebrew sons, as it was the father's bloodline and not the mother's that carries the covenant. Dun, 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 dun. Why do you think? I just want to, you know, stop and get you to think here for a second. Why do you think it's the man who circumcised? Because the seed of God has to pass through the covenant. The male carries the covenant of God. Interesting thought, isn't it? 
In doing this, Jacob was also pronouncing a prophecy over Joseph's future descendants who are returning to the land to take up their full inheritance in the Messianic era. Us. This is important information for the returning house of Israel today as they are considered full-blood sons of Jacob's family. Okay, this is important. I want you to really get this. We are not adopted. We're not orphaned. We're not Gentile believers. I've heard people say that, and that's a real oxymoron because a Gentile is someone who is uh, a pagan who is without God. So you can't be a, a, a Gentile believer because you're more than adopted. And I'm going to get into this because it's so important that we understand you are full-blooded sons. Full-blooded. Having the same inheritance, the same family, the same rights. And this is where we really messed up in, in the church and uh, in Judaism, too. We're going to go on here. The same promise and everlasting covenant given to Abraham in Genesis 13 was passed on to his son Isaac, the son of promise, and then to his grandson Jacob. Now we come to this time when it's time to pass the covenant on to Jacob's son Joseph and to his family, the fourth and fifth generation, the carriers of the covenant of the promise. Now, I, wa I want you to notice what it says here. I'm going to go to the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by who we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, our Messiah, if indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. Now, I'm going to get into this adoption thing. Remember I said we're not adopted, and it just said there in Galatians we're adopted. What's that mean? What meaneth this? Okay. Um, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born and and our translation says, under the law. But if you go back to the original Greek, and I didn't put it up on the screen, but the original Greek says either under or by. So let's say that the translators chose to translate, I believe, the more correct in context uh, how it would read. Born of a woman, born by the law, to redeem those who were by the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his father into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Messiah. Now, I'm going to go over to Ephesians here and <clears throat> Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. Just as he chose us to him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having, having predestined us to adoption, there's that word again, as sons by Yeshua, Jesus Christ, to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. Now, in Jewish culture, and in uh, the confusion is when it was translated to Greek. When you when someone is brought into your family, it's different than what we call adoption. Totally different. We, if we adopt children, I don't know, is anybody in here adopted? Okay. Oh, you, okay. So, what, did you have, uh, was there natural bloodline in the family that adopted you? Did they have other children? 
Oh, okay. Okay, so it was still in the bloodline. I've known a lot of people that have been adopted, and they will tell you that the natural-born children seem to have the favor. With God, it is not so. He doesn't see that you're grafted in. He sees that you're his son. That's what he sees. In our culture, the adoption papers mean something. In God's culture, it means nothing. You're his son now. You are the family with the same rights as the natural born. The same blessing, the same inheritance, and as far as he's concerned, the same blood. Because it's Yeshua's blood. This is, this is interesting. Okay, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're getting somewhere here. So now I'm going to go back to Genesis. So Joseph brought them from beside his knees, and he bowed down from, with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. Then Israel stretched out his hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head. So he went like this. Okay. So uh, Ephraim said, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn, and he blessed Joseph and said... God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, or the messenger who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Let my name be named upon them. And the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. That is the prophecy that is why you and I are here today. Before Yeshua, before any of that, he knew where we would be. And we would be scattered in a multitude of nations, but we would still have the seal of his name on us. I don't care if you're Irish, if you're English, if you're African, if you're Mexican, if you're, you know, whatever nationality, you are of the blood of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you're not halfway or almost. You're the real deal. And this is what was going on here. Isn't that amazing to you? You know, sometimes we don't think of Jacob as being this great prophet. But he was a great prophet because he heard God very distinctly and clearly to be able, able to make this kind of pronouncement. And so now Joseph, when he saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand. You know, I, now that I'm getting older, I know what that feels like, you know. My kids are always telling me what to do. They think I don't know something. So I could see this happening so easily. Sorry, Vicki. It's just, you know, oh, poor old mom. You know, she doesn't know what she's doing. Here, let me move your hand over here. But he knew, he knew exactly what he was doing because he was being led by the father. And so he took hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn, but your right hand is on his head. But his father refused. I could just see him tightening his grip, you know? Like, I'm not letting go of this kid's head. You're not moving my hand. <laughs> it's kind of fun to... I know, I, I, I really go out, off in my imagination world, you know, when I read these, but it's kind of fun to do that because you can kind of... You feel like you're part of it more. Because, I mean, they're people. 
just like us, you know, things happen. I could see me doing that. I'd be grabbing hold. She'd be trying to yank it off. I'd be holding on. <laughs> you know, that's just, of course, that's just me. But his, <laughs> but his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. And, and I think he didn't say it like, I know, my son, I know. I think he said, I know, my son, I know. Because that's how I would say it. <laughs> He shall become a people, and he, shall, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. Us. Us. Ephraimites. We lay hold to that claim. That's why every week, as Lance brought out, when the families are blessed, if you have sons, you say and declare over them, may you be as Ephraim and Manasseh. What is that? Why? Because that's where the covenant was passed to. Get it? The covenant was being passed to the nations, to us. I just love this stuff. I just love our God. He's so, he's so amazing. And here's where I made the note to explain what I was talking about. Ephraim and Manasseh were not adopted. The word adopted was introduced with the King James Version of the Greek interpretation of the Hebrew Bible into English, which implied that the one who was adopted was not physically connected to the new family by blood. This interpretation, now think about this, how it's really messed things up. This interpretation opened the door to a theory that made believers think they were spiritual Israelites. Because of this hypothesis, believers began to distance themselves from their Israelite identity or loose it altogether. They began to think of themselves as Goy or a Gentile, which means a pagan, which is confused and without God. Now, so be it. A lot of the church is confused without God. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I've heard it said that if Yeshua showed up at most congregations, they wouldn't let him in. They'd think he was Jewish and direct him to the synagogue down the street. So, and he is Jewish. I'm not saying he's not. I'm just saying, you know, you hear the craziest things. You hear people saying, yeah, but that was when they were Jewish and, and Jesus came as a Christian. I heard, I've heard the most outlandish, craziest things. No, we serve a Jewish Messiah. And we're going to be in a land called Israel. And that's part of the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But there's no such thing as adoption in the way that we feel about it. It says, because of this, um, they began to think of themselves as Goy or a Gentile, which means a pagan, confused and without God. With this distancing, Judah and the Jews began to treat the other tribes his brothers who had lost their identity as second-class citizens. And this has been going on for centuries. Even up until 10 years ago, most Jews looked at us like, oh, no, you don't need to keep the Torah. You're Gentiles. You don't need to keep the Torah. But you just heard what I read to you today about these Orthodox Jews that are recognizing the value of who we are. They're recognizing us as Ephraim. Because of this, Judah could not see his brothers as full-blood relatives or as part of Israel since they were too worldly in look and lifestyle. This word adopted influenced the separation and forming of a new religion called Christianity and influenced anti-Semitism in the church, which led to major atrocities against the Jews. The Hebraic understanding of adoption is absolute sonship. We are absolute sons of the king. We're not second-class citizens. We are absolute. And those who believe in the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, are considered biblically full-blood 
natural sons of Israel, and heirs according to the eternal everlasting covenant and promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You got that? We're not adopted. We are full-blooded sons of the king. In Galatians 3, 7, and also 29, notice what it reads. Understand then that those who believe are children, are full blood, sons of Abraham. If you belong to Yeshua, then you are Abraham's seed, and I put in parentheses, full-blooded sons, heirs according to the promise through the Abrahamic covenant, which gave us a land, a people, and a blessing. That's what the Abrahamic covenant is. Now, if we want to go to the Greek, seed, as, it, as we just read here in Galatians 3, 7, and 29, uh, that we are Abraham's seed. Notice what seed is in the Greek. Seed in the Greek is sperma, meaning physical seed or traceable DNA. First century Gnostics, Gnosticism in the church taught separation of the physical realm, which was actually any Hebrew um, connection with which they considered flawed and corrupt. They thought the Jews had it all wrong. They were, you know, bad, 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 bad people. Jacob, Israel, did not have spiritual sons. Isaac did not have spiritual sons, nor did Abraham. Seed in Scripture is not a spiritual reference, nor does it mean spiritual Israel. Seed in, in the Greek term means physical. In other words, you have just as much right to the land as big brother Judah does because you are a full-blooded son. Does that make sense to you guys? You getting it? Okay, because it's really important, I think, for the time we're living in right now. Notice what, what our own Messiah, what Yeshua said here in Matthew 20, 12, saying, these men have worked, and it's the parable of the, the workers in the field, you know, where they, you know, come in at the last minute, which is what we're doing. <laughs> this parable is all about you and about me. And it says, these last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us, who have borne the burden in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? And take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give it to this last man and the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first and the first last. For many are called, but few, and I know you've heard this scripture, uh, scripture, scripture quoted, few chosen, but it actually, if you go to the original Greek, many are called, but few choose. So here you have it. Last week I shared the parable of the prodigal son and how the big brother was jealous because here he's been off and squandering his money and doing, you know, sleeping with the pigs and doing all that. He was mad. Now Yeshua gives us another parable about us coming in at the last days. And why is he so mad? You know, he didn't sh share in the heat of the day, like, you know, all the persecution. You know, I, big brother Judah, have experienced the Holocaust, all this. Here, we come bebopping in believing in Messiah, and at the last minute, we get the same reward. I can understand why Judah might be upset. Can you? You might say, wait a minute. They didn't go through what I went through. They're coming in last, and then it's pretty easy now. In com I mean, we're going to go through a tribulation and all that, but it's pretty easy compared to what they've spent thousands of years doing because of the prophecy Jacob gave them to keep the Torah, which they did. We wouldn't have the Bible today if it wasn't for our big brother Judah. We owe him big time. We do. It's just, it's just, it just, doesn't it just blow your mind how accurate scripture is? Duh, the king of the universe did it. 
you know? But sometimes I, amaze, I get so amazed, and then I feel stupid because I'm thinking, well, yeah, he knows everything. Why wouldn't it be so accurate, you know? But it's still amazing, you know, especially, I think, because I went so many years not understanding what I was reading. Notice I'm going back here to Genesis again, and we're going to close. And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Talk about a prophet. He had, things were hardly rolling then back in those days. For heaven's sakes, Shem, I think, was still alive, you know, that came off of Noah's boat. I mean, these were ancient days, and they, here Jacob's already going to tell his sons what's going to happen now. In these days, what a prophet he was. He says, gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. This is the first time the expression latter or end of days, aharit hayamim, appears in the Bible. The very first time. Whew, what a prophet. Here he's going to start, you know, prophesying to you. And notice what it uh, says here. Um, Examine the root of acharit, meaning uh, it's being a, an aleph, a, sh, a het, and a resh, from which are derived after, last, tomorrow, another, and also achar, or achare, uh, or har, har, pardon my Hebrew, acharnit, meaning behind or backwards. Thus, when reference is made to aharit, the end, there is also a remez, a hint, to that which was behind, that which had already occurred beforehand, indicating a circulatory movement that links the past to the future, worlds without end. Now, I, you can go totally nuts... You can go totally nuts trying to figure God out in eternity, right? Because there is no time in eternity. So Yahweh could be here now and there then, and it all be at the same time. Now, that will, whew, you know, I, I, I'm not even close to being smart enough to even get my head around it, you know? Don probably had it figured out last week, but, <laughs> but man, you know, but the accuracy, the pinpoint accuracy. Okay, now get this. This is so cool. Just as Kadim sta also stands for East, there are several references to Haharan, literally last, meaning West, the last, a haran. So, when you put it all together, so the last days conveys movement from the east to the west. So, Yehuda in the east, the Torah, the land, the blessing, the people, goes west to the rest of the brothers. This is powerful. There is not one detail that he's left out. And notice what Yeshua said in Matthew 24, 27 through 28. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so it will be the coming of the Son of Man, or so will the, son, the coming of the Son of Man be. Whoa! See, now when you used to read that, didn't you just think it was going to happen quick? Like lightning? I did. Had no clue how intricately that was tied in to the, the meaning of the last days. Because we didn't know Hebrew. Is this amazing stuff? This is all Yahweh. All, all, all Yahweh. Notice what uh, Jacob goes on to say to Judah. He says, Judah, you are he whom, whom your brothers shall praise. 
Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lays down like a lion. And as a lion, who will rouse him? The scepter, scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. So Torah is all about being of the tribe of Judah, the lawgiver, the keeper of the law, you know. The only one that would keep the law would be the house of Judah. Is that crazy to you to think about where we're at today? I don't know. It just, it's, it's just mind-boggling to me. Now, remember I told you I was going to tie in the donkey, too, because I got the crazy rabbis, the, you know, uh, all of this. Now we're going to go to the donkey and how that ties in to Scripture. Oops. Did I miss it? Oh, yeah. Uh, Genesis 49, 10 through 12, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Notice what it says in verse 11, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Speaking of Yeshua, the Lion of Judah, and tying. Okay, we're going to get to the tying. Just, I'm trying to wrap it up, but this is so good. Okay, if we go to the Strong's Concordance, Om from um, the Strong's Concordance means a people a congregated unit, specifically a tribe or troops or attendants or figuratively a flock. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. this. And also it says uh, in Strong's Concordance, Yichaha, from the same as obedience, gathering to obey. Now watch, I'm going to tie it all together here. Notice what it says in Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, the battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Speaking about our Messiah. For I have bent Judah, my bow, fitted the bow with Ephraim. Whoa! You know, when you fit the bow, we're the weapon that God has used in the earth to go. Is this crazy? It's amazing. And that's exactly what has happened. We were scattered throughout the entire inhabited earth to share Messiah for such a time as this. I don't know if that gets you guys excited, but it gets me excited because I, I guess you know what, it, you know why it gets me so excited? Because I know that I know that I know that I know that my God is faithful, my God is true, and that his word does not return void, and everything he has promised has come to pass, is coming to pass, and will come to pass. That is something to be excited about. I mean, it truly is. We, you know, we sit in congregations so much of the time, you know, looking like people got their face sucked through a pipe or something, and you're like, what? Why? We should be the most joyous, the happiest, the most upbeat, the most, we know stuff. That the world doesn't know. We should be excited to share it. And not just keep it to ourselves. 
Oh, I just, oh, this is so crazy. Okay, I didn't finish right, reading that. And raised up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and made you like the sword of a mighty man. Then the Lord will be seen over them. Notice what this so ties in with Messiah. You're going to love this. And his arrow shall go forth like lightning. What are the days of Messiah? The lightning from the east to the west. Oh, you guys should be excited. This is, then the Lord God will blow the trumpet. Feast of trumpets. And go with whirlwinds from the south. Now notice, I'm going to go to Hosea. I'm trying to, I'm trying to go fast here, so I really want you to get all of this. Okay, Hosea 8, 8 and 9. Israel is swallowed up. Now, where is Israel? Among the Gentiles. You crazy-looking Egyptians, you. Look at that. Like a vessel in which is no pleasure, for they have gone up to Assyria like a wild donkey. <laughs> I think that's the Lord's kind way of calling us a bunch of jackasses. I don't know, just my own thoughts, you know. Because um, we all have been. Has anybody here not been? I, I'll admit it. Okay, good. Got a few honest people out there. Like a wild donkey alone by itself, Ephraim has hired lovers. We dwelt among the pigs, like the prodigal son. Now notice what Messiah says. And he said to them, go into the village opposite you. And as you, uh, that's Mark 11, 2 through 3. And he says, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. Now, if you didn't grow up on a farm, you don't know how crazy this is. That means the colt hasn't been broken. That means, talk about wild, it should be bucking and going and, you know, that's us. But Messiah sat on it. That's a big deal. It's a big deal. And he says, loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. The Lord has need of you, wild donkeys. He has need of me. We're the arrow that Judah is the bow. It's our source. It's where we come from. We come from the bow, but we're the arrow because you can direct the arrow to hit a target. Will you hear the call? It's the call of Ephraim, you and me, that Yeshua rides on like the lightning from the east to the west. It's a sign is what that means. We're a sign that we're entering into the, the messianic age. You're the sign. I'm the sign. We're the sign that scripture speaks of. I think I'm going to stop right there. Because I think it's a good place to stop. I think what we, we need to do as God's people is understand that we have purpose in our lives. We have direction in our lives. God's using you as, as a weapon, but not to destroy, but to pierce the heart. He's using you to bring glory to his name, to bring honor to his name. For people to turn and say, you have something that nobody else I've ever met has. You have greater joy. You have greater shalom. You have greater peace. You treat one another differently than any... I'm probably driving the camera guys nuts right now. <laughs> but you treat people differently. Yeshua said that people should know us by the love we have among us. 
They don't see the love among us if we're arguing over how to pronounce the name. I know I'm talking to somebody, maybe not in here, but out there somewhere. That's not how we're to be known. We are to be known for the love. Why? Because Yeshua loved you. He loved me. He loves Ephraim. We're his sons. We're his bloodline. We're not adopted. We're not redheaded stepchildren. We're his sons. I can say that if any of my cousins are listening out there because a lot of you had red hair. So you know what I'm talking about. Um, I was always scared to death. I know this is a rabbit trail that one of my kids would be born with red hair because my cousins that had red hair, they were the meanest. And I realized later after I grew up is because they had to fight more, you know? So I always didn't want any of my kids to have red hair because half my family's redheaded and half of them are blonde, but I know that's way off the subject. But I just wanted to share with you guys today the vision, the purpose, the destiny that each and every one of us holds and that God is counting on us. Just as much as he knew he could find that colt, that wild donkey, and be able to ride it through the streets of Jerusalem, he's counting on finding you and knows he's going to find you and that you'll answer the call, that you will choose, and that he will ride in on you. Amazing. Amazing. Amen. I love you guys. Thank you for putting up with my craziness, but I get excited sometimes when I hear read this stuff and I'm, you know, it's just it's just amazing stuff. Um, love you guys. And um I, I I guess in my heart I just want everybody to know what a blessing that they really are. I think so much of the time we don't realize that we are a blessing in God's economy of things and in his kingdom. And his desire is for us to know that we're his, his sons, that we're his blood, and he loves you. So I will leave you with that, and uh, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll receive the morning uh, tithes and offerings. Father, we just, uh, we just come before you right now, and we're humbled, we're amazed, we're just in awe of you. We're in awe of everything about you. We're in awe of your love for us. We're in awe of your caring. And we're in awe of the destiny that you've called us to, to be a blessing, to reach others, to be directed to others, and to let them know of your goodness, of your righteousness, of your mercy, of your love. Father, we just come to you now in praise and thanksgiving. Father, I ask for you to bless everyone who gives today. Give it back to them abundantly, Father, that none of your people will experience lack, but that we will all prosper in your kingdom because of our obedience to our king. Not because we deserve it, not because you um, d don't um, lead our lives and guide our lives and that we submit ourselves to you, and we certainly don't demand from you, but... Part of your covenant is that you would bless your people. And so we thank you for that. We give honor to you, our King. We give honor to you this day for all that you're doing in our lives and in our hearts, most importantly. Father, we just, you know, even as we give, I just ask for hearts to change, hearts to melt, hearts to understand that we're your sons and daughters, that we are of the bloodline of our Messiah and our King. We give you honor and praise this day in the name of our King. Amen. Mm -hmm.